Now that we have our board, we'll want to start programming our designs onto it so that we can interact with them and see them working in real life, not just a simulator. While the implementation stage of compilation takes care of how our designs are mapped to the logic elements on the FPGA chip, we need to tell the compiler which pins to use for our inputs and outputs. In this screencast, we'll look at how we can map pins in quarters to interact with the peripherals on the D10 Lite board. Most FPGA devices have a number of pins ranging in the hundreds. Like all ICs, an FPGA's pins allow the circuitry inside to connect to the outside world, linking up to other devices, peripherals, or maybe voltage signals. Unlike most ASICs, however, the internal circuitry of an FPGA is entirely reconfigurable. The internal design can be changed any number of times, with each design having a different requirement from the device's pins. This means that the signals to and from these pins will need to be routed to different areas of the device ad hoc, and this routing needs to be manageable by the system's designers. Remembering what we've learned about FPGA architecture, we can see how these connections are made. As we've seen in the chip planner, one of the fundamental components of the FPGA is the I.O. cell. These blocks are hardwired to the physical pins on the device. We can use the chip planner to have a look at the block's architecture. It's quite complex, so let's simplify it a bit. We have our pad at the top, which is directly connected to our physical pin, and a buffer each for input and output. With this duplication of buffers, as well as some tri-state control, each I.O. cell can be set as an input, output, or bidirectional, giving each pin a huge amount of flexibility. These buffers can be hooked up to the interconnect to route the signal into or out of any CLB on the device. There's also the possibility to run the signals through dedicated flip-flops or delay units within the I.O. cell. This would allow for fine-grain control over propagation delay, particularly with very time-sensitive external connections. By routing the signals from our I.O. blocks to CLBs, our digital designs can interact with and process signals from outside the FPGA device. But how do we do this in our projects? Well, we've already been working with I.O. in our designs, we just haven't ever hooked them up to physical pins. Every design we've created, barring test benches of course, have had a list of input and output ports to connect to parent and child modules in the hierarchy. At the top level, these ports are connected directly to pins on the chip. On the DE10 lightboard that we're using, these pins are hardwired on the PCB to various peripherals, so we can easily connect our designs to switches, LEDs and buttons or connect to external devices using GPIO. In order to connect our designs to the pins, we need to get to grips with a new quarters tool, the Pin Planner. The Pin Planner allows us to manually assign the ports in our design to physical pins on the chip. We're given a list of inputs and outputs, also known as nodes, within our design and various parameters concerning the physical pins that they're to be connected to. We can use this list to assign the physical location of the nodes, as well as set the voltage and current standards for each pin or pin bank. There are a lot of columns here, but there's only really five that we need to know anything about for now. The node name is self-explanatory, it's the name of the port within our design. This is a key example of why we should use clear names for our ports, something which I have to admit I haven't done here. If I had seven modules with inputs named variations on A and B, it's going to be very hard to tell the difference between them all. The location is the key column here. In a fresh design, this will be completely blank, as you'll see later, meaning that the node isn't actually connected to a physical pin. We type in the name of the pin that we wish to connect the node to, and the next time the fitter is run, it'll assign the signal to that pin. The I.O. bank column states which bank or collection of pins the one that we've selected is a part of. Going back to the pin map diagram, we can see from the colour coding that our pins are organised into these banks. The banks will have a common voltage and current and take up a continuous area on the device. Keeping pins within the same bank can be important in designs with mixed voltage levels, as each bank will be tied to its own reference voltage or maybe clock domain. So we'd want all 3.3 volt pins in one bank and all 2.5 volt pins in another, for example. We can set these voltage levels in the I.O. standard column. This is something that we're going to need to pay close attention to when we're setting pins in our designs, as mismatching voltage levels in a best case scenario could result in improper pin triggering, but in a worst case scenario could end up wrecking either the FPGA itself or something that it connects to. 
The last column we're going to look at here is the fitter location column. This is the pin that the fitter has assigned the node to in the previous compilation. If the node was manually assigned before compiling, the value here should match the value in the location column. But if not, the fitter will automatically assign it a location. Be aware that not all pins on the chip are the same. Every single pin has a specialization for one or more particular purposes, but most will also act as a GPIO. Those that don't are usually directly connected to a voltage source or a ground line, but there are also key pins which we may want to use for their dedicated purpose. In the scope of this module, we'll mainly just be using the GPIO pins which connect to the devices and peripherals on the PCB, so you don't need to worry too much about what their other purposes are. But in the later lab sessions this semester, we'll need to be using dedicated clock pins to drive some registered logic. Once we assign physical pins to our nodes, we need to run the implementation stage of compilation to place and route our design for our device's architecture, respecting the pin assignments that we've made. This can mean that the logic moves to a completely different location to reduce the amount of routing through into connects required. As part of this stage of compilation, Quartus generates a couple of pin map files, which can be read to easily view a list of current assignments. Soon, or later on in this lab session, we're going to be wanting to assign pins to connect to the components on the DE10 light board. Therefore, we'll need to know two key parameters to set in the pin mapper, which pins on the FPGA the external components are connected to, and the voltage levels at which they operate. Luckily, all of this information can be found in the DE10 lights user manual. It contains information about all the components and peripherals connected to the FPGA device, including the pins to which they're connected and the voltage levels at which they operate. As stated before, the user manual should be your first port of call to learn about the peripherals and how to interact with them. The information is there, you just need to look for it. You should use this information to set the physical location and the I.O. standard of your pins within the pin planner. All other relevant columns should fill in automatically, either as you assign the pins or when the implementation stage is run. I'm now going to give you a quick run through of how to assign pins for a very simple design. I veered away from my massive sandbox project this time, as that's now a big mess of different modules and pins with no semblance of order, so it's easier to start afresh. The simple project that I'm using here is called A and B, which, as you might guess, is a small project which takes two inputs and ands them to produce an output. We've got a single module at the top of the hierarchy which does just that, and other than that, not really that much going on. Now, before we start messing around with pin assignments, let's take a look at how this design is fit onto the device. Before starting this video, I did a full compilation, so every stage has been run, and Quartz has generated netlists and programming files for this design to fit into particular logic blocks on the device, and I imagine some pins have been auto-assigned as well. So let's have a look in the chip planner. We can zoom straight into the slightly darker coloured block to see the exact logic element that our design has been placed in. As it's so simple, we only need this one lookup table, which has a unique address, given here at the top as LCCOM X26Y1N0, or rather, the first logic cell in the block located in row 1 of column 26. Our data C line represents our A input, and our data D line our B input giving the lookup table the sum equation of C and D. If we right-click our data C line and select Go to Source node, we can see the I.O. cell this input has been automatically assigned to. We've got the familiar blue lines here showing the signals flow through the I.O. cell. It enters at the pad and runs into the buffer. Interestingly, it goes through some delay logic before heading off to the CLB. This appears to be a default setting for the Max 10 devices, and can presumably be removed if we're wanting a very high-speed design. So this is one of the I.O. cells that our design has been automatically assigned to. Which pin is it actually connected to? Well, if we right-click on the input of the buffer and click Go to Source node, the focus changes to the pad itself, and the location is displayed up here in the node selection pane, pin AB4. Now this is very unlikely to be the pin that we actually want our design to be connected to, so let's do some proper pin mapping. We can access the pin planner through the assignments menu. 
As you've seen earlier in this video, we're met with a graphical representation of the pins on our device, as well as complex display and reporting tasks on the left here. We don't really need any of this for the purposes of this module, so we're just going to focus on the pin assignment options down at the bottom. The table here contains a list of nodes in our design. We've got the two inputs, A and B, and our single output, X. Notice that some of these columns are already filled in with default values, most noticeably the automatic assignments in the fitter location column and some default voltage and current standards. It's here that we can assign our pins to connect up the design to the components on board. So what do we actually want to do? Seeing as our design is just a simple AND gate, we want to be able to toggle the inputs and display an output. So we'll take two switches as our inputs controlling an LED. We need to find out which pins our LEDs and switches are connected to on the board, so let's consult the user manual and find out. We'll start with the switches. On page 26, we've got this big table giving the pin locations of each of the 10 switches on board, as well as the voltage standard that they require. Given the orientation on the board, we'll map A to switch 1 and B to switch 0. So back in our pin planner, we'll set node A's location to pin underscore C11 and B's location to pin underscore C10. Both pins need the 3.3 volt LVTTL standard, so we'll change that column as well. Everything else here can be left as default. Now over to the LEDs, the table for which can be found on page 27. We'll just use LED R0 as our output, and we can see here that it's connected to pin A8, again with a 3.3 volt LVTTL standard, so we'll make that change in the pin planner too. Now that all of our nodes are assigned, we need to run a full compilation again, so that our design is refit based on our assignments. Once that's complete, we can take a look in the chip planner to see what's changed. So we can see that the logic block our design is using is now all the way at the top of the chip. If we zoom in on it, we can see that we're using an element two-thirds of the way down the block. So let's open it up and have a look. So we can see in the node selection tab up here that we're looking at the 24th block in the 53rd row of the 51st column, so a complete change in location. Let's trace the signals back to see why that is. Our logic block is directly adjacent to the I.O. block, which contains the cells for both of our input pins. Which makes sense, we want to keep propagation delay as low as possible, but what about our output LED? If we go back into our logic cell and look at the destination node, we can see that it isn't particularly far away either. It's likely that the designers of the DE10 light board did this on purpose, keeping the fixed I.O. within a small area on the chip to keep delays down and free up the rest of the device for some general purpose stuff. So now that we've checked the pins have been correctly assigned, we can actually program our device to see our design in action. This process is shown in the next screencast.